So hello everybody, today I'm going to talk about some new analysis of a 10 meter supercell simulation that produces an EF5 tornado. It's very clear from this conference, we all know this, that the factors that discriminate between non-tornadic, weakly tornadic, or strongly tornadic supercells remain poorly understood, as well as the process of tornado genesis. So in this talk, I'm going to focus on the details of tornado genesis in an LES simulation of a supercell done with CM1. I have reported on this simulation a couple of times. In addition to traditional visualization techniques, I'm going to employ a simple vortex tracking code in order to conduct vortex relative analysis during the process of tornado genesis. So what does vortex relative mean in this context? From the perspective of the location of the vortex core over time, and I identify the vortex core location as a location of lowest local pressure perturbation from base state on a horizontal plane. The initial vortex relative analysis I'm going to share with you today involves looking at values of pressure perturbation and vorticity magnitude along the vortex core. And rather than detecting vortices, I'm really just tracking them using a vortex seed location. In the simulation, it's very clear that there's a non-tornadic vortex that sort of starts the whole game going for the, the tornado that, or the, the vortex that becomes the EF5 tornado. So we can essentially run the simulation backwards to the origin of the initial seed vortex location as determined by a local drop in, low pre in local drop in pressure at the surface. So I go forward in time from this initial center of low pressure at the surface, and then after I track the vortex at the surface, I go back to those files and I go upwards from each vortex location and or vortex uh, pressure drop location and, and tra trace it as high as I can. Um, and there's no interpolation done here. I save the Cartesian locations of all the uh, vortex core locations so I can go back and then calculate other things or show other things along the vortex. And this is what it looks like when you're done. Those yellow spheres all indicate the center of the vortex core. So some notable times and events during the simulation. At time equals 5175, that is the uh, time of the vortex genesis, near ground vortex genesis of the, uh, the early vortex that becomes the tornado. 70, 45 seconds after uh, the, the first vortex genesis, we see EF0 winds at the surface, and 70 seconds after that, we see EF5 winds at the surface. So things happen quickly, but not so quickly that we can't learn something, I think. Okay, starting out with some more traditional analysis, I'm going to show pressure perturbation isosurfaces, three different values along with the vorticity magnitude at the surface. So the little nubbies you see in the volume are vortices, uh, ostensibly vortices, and I'm shading them by vorticity magnitude. Pause right here. So at this point, we have a coherent two kilometer long vortex. It's certainly implied by drops in pressure at these three different heights and also spin up at the surface. So this is you know, this is prior to tornado genesis. This is the process of tornado genesis. Uh, we have a vortex merger that occurs, and then we have two more vortex mergers that occur. Uh, but we now we have 60 meter per second winds of the surface, calling that tornado time with the red T that's flashed up. Uh, this, the vortex continues to strengthen, and we have a third vortex merger right here that is very important. It really uh, starts the whole uh, EF5 part of the simulation going. Now looking at storm relative horizontal winds in the volume rendering and ground relative winds at the surface. Now it's a tornado. I'm just showing at the surface the tornado strength winds. You can see the tornado doesn't really rage for right away. It gets going at EF0, EF1 strength, and then it's right about at this point right here where you start to see a really strong growth, a very strong bottom-up signature in the horizontal wind speed, which is what we're showing in the volume rendered here, volume rendering here. So the bottom-up uh, portion is very strong in this, but it's sort of after it's started becoming a tornado. Uh, tornado time again, we're gonna show these two fields at the same time. Pressure at the left, showing the, the dropping of the pressure along the length of the vortex, continual dropping of pressure, and then there's the third vertex merger, what I call vortex C in ORF 2 2019 paper. And at the right, you'll notice that you really don't see a bottom-up signature until right about now. But prior to that, the, the horizontal winds along the vortex kind of uh, speed up at the same rate along the vortex, at least the bottom two kilometers. Here's a, another rendering. There's the vortex that becomes a tornado. There's the first merger. Uh, um, this is showing around one inverse second vorticity tornado. Now we have the second merger and then the big third merger, which this is the best view I've shown of this, where you see how that the th third merger results in a coiling of the two vortices together to become uh, a very strong EF5 tornado. Okay, so now let's look at some of this vortex relative stuff. What you're seeing here are the locations of the vortex core. This is the first 
what I'm freezing in time here is the first trace, and it's very early, and you notice there's lots of discontinuities because we really haven't got a vortex yet. So I'll start the animation, and you can see that the surface vortices are doing their thing. I've shown this before, and right about now, the, vor the algorithm kicks in, and you can see how almost immediately uh, we have a coherent vortex along its length, at least defined by... Uh, by these low pressure centers. We had a first merger right there. Don't blink, you might have missed it. There's a second merger. I'll show this again. And then we have vortex merger three that really gets the ball going here. On the right, I describe the process by which I do the vortex core detection. It's very simple. Notice I put a box around the vortex core that shows its, its volumetric extent. Notice how that box gets much more small and, and, and columnar towards the end as the vortex becomes uh, more vertically erect. Now here's the cool part. On the left, we got vorticity magnitude. On the right, pressure perturbation. These are values along the vortex core now. So this is the vortex relative analysis I've been talking about, or at least the beginning of some analysis. Uh, interesting phenomenon. It's a tornado now. Notice in the vorticity field, you have these, um, these spin-ups near the ground, which is very interesting. You also have vertically propagating wave motion. That's pretty evident here, not really sure how to interpret this at this point and the pressure definitely uh, run, runs away uh, at a certain point gets very low and very in the lowest pressure on the ground you go from a, a, a regime where the lowest pressure is aloft and it's then it's lowest to the ground so these vorticity lapse rates I don't know what to really call them they're interesting they're they occur periodically sort of sporadically they seem to be you know associated with some of these oscillations that occur later on I'm not sure yet. Um, here's the same views only looking at the bottom 200 meters. So you remember the vertical grid spacing is 10 meters So is the horizontal grid spacing So this isn't the first grid point over the ground kind of a problem that you sometimes run into with numerical models It seems to be you know regardless of the free slip boundary condition. It seems to be a, 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 a feature that it just probably has has physical has physical origins. So it's a tornado now uh, you know we're about minus 20 HPA uh, the mergers are occurring etc. But again, you can see that uh, that those spin-ups that sort of occur at the ground where you often see this, the largest amounts of vorticity at the first, yes, at the first grid point above the ground, but it drops off uh, over the next several. So this is something I'm definitely going to be looking into the dynamics of what's going on near the surface here. It seems to be important. And I'll show again the uh, storm relative horizontal velocity on the left and then um, the, the vortex relative stuff on the right, just to show that you know, there's a plenty going on before we have tornado strength winds on the ground. And right there, we've got tornado strength winds on the ground. I mean, that's the first indication. It kind of goes down below that a little bit and kind of hovers around that EF0 line for a while until this point where you have the, the third vortex merger um, where it really starts to, to spin up. But it's a pretty gradual, it's certainly not linear in any shape, way, shape, or form, but it's, uh, it's, it's a gradual process that, that um, you know, it'd be interesting to see to sort of peel apart the, dyna the dynamics here. So I'm showing a very transparent vortex core on the left just to show you how effective this is and how you can trace the vortex long before it shows up pretty strongly in the pressure field uh, with traditional analyses. Now I'm going to point out vortex C right here, the third merger. Uh, there is its location as it sort of sweeps around the main vortex and you can see how it's pretty strong aloft and then it kind of just draws it back into the center of the mesocyclone. I wonder how important processes like these really are in real storms. Now pause here for a second. This is a view from the top looking down and let it go. Um, notice it, the vortex as it becomes a tornado is, is definitely connected to the heart of the mesocyclone, but then it spins outward or spirals outward from that location. I don't know what's going on here, but look what happens near the ground. The arrow indicates that vortex C, you can see it in the pressure field and notice how it just, the algorithm snaps it into being the more prominent vortex because it's got the lowest pressure now. So interesting things going on. Here's a view from the bottom at twice the speed for the sake of time. Again, it's sort of around the periphery of the updraft. Um, as time goes on, it gets sort of um, drawn more close to the heart of the updraft, but very right along a line of very uh, strong uh, horizontal gradient of the vertical wind. Finally, the cold pool in the updraft, along with the surface trace of theta rho prime to show you where the tornado is. See how it's sort of ensconced within the cold pool. In this simulation, the mesocyclone is, is parked over the cold pool. It's, it, it's unusual in that case. I know that you know there's evidence that maybe up to 90% of supercells draw most of their air in from uh, the environment. This is not one of those storms, but it is kind of a, an unusual storm in, in the strength of the tornado and the longevity. So I wouldn't expect this to necessarily be an average supercell or do average things. But you can see where the tornado lies within the cold pool. Here's another view of that. From the bottom, you can see that first vortex connection thing happening right there, vortex merger one. 
uh, the second and third word mergers occur. And, and you can see how the cold air just kind of wraps around the tornado. Uh, certainly there's arguments to be made about baroclinic generation, but with the, uh, the residence time of these parcels, I don't know how much time they have to generate it. Um, and finally, I'm showing vorticity magnitude. Um, I could envision going up different vortices uh, and, and using the same process and just kind of comparing what's going on, you know, starting to treat vortices as objects. That's what I'd really like to go with this work. If I can, I'm on the first, you know, the first stage is to do this and just to trace the vortex, but then to treat them as objects is, is, a, is a goal. So let me summarize my talk. Before there's a tornado, there's a vortex, and it's a it's not very strong, but it does uh, connect up to three kilometers or so, and it, it uh, definitely grows in an interesting way um, along the vortex length. It's a very highly tilted vortex during Genesis. Um, following the third of three mergers, it becomes uh, very much vertically oriented, and during Genesis, the vortex aloft disconnects from the heart of the updraft and is then drawn back in following a vortex merger and there is uh the vortex strength kind of uh grows pretty much the same along its length in the bottom two kilometers until a very strong bottom-up signature occurs in the velocity field um, that sort of uh, brings on the efi portion of the tornado i've done the vortex relative analysis using a very simple vortex tracking algorithm basic um, all i do is seed a, a vortex location follow that location over time uh, this is made possible by the high spatial and temperature tem temporal resolution. The vortex magnitude and pressure along the vortex exhibit complex behavior, including oscillations that can be tracked over time, along with these, these very strong gradients of vorticity at the surface. Um, these occur sporadically in the lowest 50 to 100 meters of the atmosphere, and often you have the strongest vorticity of the tornado occurring at the first grid point above the ground. So future work, I want to identify what's going on during the ground, during these, during these uh, vorticity lapse rates. Uh, I want to construct vortex core objects to define vortices so that I can calculate circulation and other things along the vortex and don't have to make the vertical uh, vortex assumption. Uh, make some smarter, smarter vortex tracking code to identify multiple vortices. Quantify the role of vortex mergers, which appear super important in this particular simulation. It's, it may be that they're very important in the atmosphere. I mean, you can just additively add vorticity together, double the vorticity maybe, just by bringing two vortices together. Um, you know, it'd be interesting to look at an analysis of, you know, how much stretching is required to get a vortex to do the same thing as a merger would do or whatnot. Because these things seem to add up vorticity pretty quickly along the entire vortex length. And finally... I know this is a super high-end storm. It's unusual. It's got a lot of things about it that are weird, but it's also a long track EF5, which is kind of weird. It doesn't happen very often, but we do need to start looking at more run-of-the-mill supercells and tornadoes. That is something that I'm already in the process of doing. Um, so with that in mind, I will take any questions, and thank you very much for your time.